a master at text. That means you have incredible control over text. You can tweak every part of your text. So this file is called exercise six text formatting. If you click on this text, it's kind of a box is black arrow, right? You see that is a, a, a box, you know, with text in it. Now, what happens if you double click in it? It will tell you edit the text, make cause changes, say update. That's okay. I'll show you how to edit text. So I, I did this on purpose because some of you will find that when you open that template we gave you for project 01, it's highlighted in pink. And what that simply means is that you're missing the font on your system. So the font I had for this file th that is, is this Myriad Roman, you see that little diamond next to it means I don't have it on my system. I probably have a regular Myriad or I have other fonts, but definitely don't have that one. So how do you fix that? You have two ways. One, you can go and download that font or activate it from a type font manager. Um, or you can simply reformat. It means if you don't have a, a client to please that really demands that you use that specific font, you can simply just go and format it with a different uh, type, right? So you go in a different typography or a different font typeface is the perfect term so you can see that I do have Myriad Pro for example I just don't have the Roman so I can say I'm gonna, I want it, I want Myriad Pro now notice that now it's not pink anymore what else can you do with the text let's talk about illustrator and text you can see that you can tweak the point size you can say I want it bigger you can tweak this part and this picture gives you a sense of what this is it's by the way it's called letting and is the distance between the line of text. I'm going to give you a ballpark idea of what the distance should be. For a small type like this one, you should always aim for at least three points bigger than the point of the, the size. So if your type is 12 point, you should probably at least have 15. Why does it matter? Because it makes, you can see I just went to 15 and it jumped a little bigger. It makes the typography really more readable. Basically, it helps with readability. So that's called letting, and is the vertical space between the line. Right here, you have something called kerning that allows you to tweak the space between pairs of characters. So kernings really matter when you, for example, click in between S and the I, and then you go in there and you increase it. It unfortunately doesn't show very much. Let me do it in another way. I'm using option right arrow key and you can see it goes at 287 and I can see that I'm tweaking that space. Uh, the only time when you do stuff like that is when you're really a good designer and you you're want to kind of create a certain effect. Another one that you do want to though control just like the lighting up here is this one and it's called tracking. And that's the spacing between the overall letters in your um, in your text. I always put at least a five or a ten tracking because again increases the, the the white space around the letter and it makes it more readable. Another thing you can obviously do is go under paragraph and right now is just left align. You can change the left alignment. You can say I actually want 10 points on the left and you can see that I got 10 points. You can obviously choose how many points you want on the right. Maybe you say I want 30 points on the right. Oops, I put 300 in there. I apologize. Uh, 30 points on the right. You can decide that you want a, a first line indentation. So you can say I want 30 there. And you can see that every time you have that paragraph break, the first line will have that. Uh, so you can really tweak, and also here you tweak the space between the paragraphs. So you can say I want 10 in there. You see now all the space in between this paragraph got increased. And you can tweak the space below the paragraphs, and now it's going to be even bigger, right? Because I, if I have the, the above and the below, as you can see, is is going to be a lot. So um, that's what you can tweak. Now you can tweak it through, obviously you can decide you want to justify it. Every paragraph is justified except for the last line uh, because if you justify also the last line, sometimes it does some monstrosity like this. Do you see that? Ooh, ouch, it hurts. Um, another thing you can do though, and I really want you to learn these shortcuts because they're amazing. You can achieve all the stuff we just did in the, especially 
the tracking and the letting, like even the kerning, as you noticed earlier. So let's say I want to increase more the tracking. If I hold Option and the right arrow key on the keyboard, it allows me to increase it. Sorry, let me go in here and select the text. Option, right arrow key, do you see that it is increasing it tremendously to the point that if I go in here now, is 110. It used to be 10, now it's 110. So option arrow keys definitely allows you to tweak the spacing in terms of the tracking. It also allows you to increase the letting. Right now if I select my whole text and I do option arrow key that points down at this time, it allows me to increase or decrease the letting. So remember that these um, option arrow keys also allow you to do some amazing stuff. Like if I want to tweak the space between the A and the L, the faster way to do it is not to go here, because if I only increase it a few points, it doesn't make much of a difference. If I type 400, it makes a difference. Or I do option right arrow key, and it kind of, as you can see, keeps going. Now we're at 860. So remember, all this is, is a really, really powerful to just, you know, format text. Another way to deal with text, though, I want to show you. In Illustrator, there are many kinds of text. I'm going to tear this off so I can see it right here. Whenever you click with the text tool, it creates this placeholder called lorem ipsum text, right? Notice if I click and drag, I'm actually deforming the text. So I beg you, do not click, it, click and drag. So what if you want to actually fill a container with text? And, and this happens. You say, oh, wait a minute, what do I do? So the way it works out is you create a container. Let's create a rectangle. I'm going to actually uh, swap the fill and the stroke. And then if you look at your tools, you have the regular type tool. The regular type tool is something that you basically select and you click in here and you start typing. And you say, okay, I'm going to, instead of lowering Ibsen, I'm going to type Enrica Rocks. Yeah right? Or another way to input text is to click on this one, and this one is called area type tool. That means it wants to have an area to fill. So you have to have a shape you created already. So I'm going to click on here, and you see my cursor is this weird dotted circle around it, a little, you know, looks like the, 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 the point type, but it has the circle around it. If I click now, it fills it up with text, lorem ipsum text, or obviously you can start typing whatever you want. I'm actually going, and then you can format it the way I showed you earlier. So that's another way to go. Another way to go is to create a path. So let me go in here and say I'm going to create a spiral, big spiral, and then select this that is called the type on a path tool and click on that spiral. You see that this time the cursor, instead of having that circle, dotted circle, has a dotted little curve. And, like, and when I click on this, it dumps text on it. How do I control it? How do I get that text to go all the way back here? You want to deselect it first. And you see this weird uh, line at the beginning and at the end? If you grab onto that line and, and drag, it's basically moving along that curve. If you somehow grab this line, and go in too much, I'll show you what happens. It will clip it. You see that plus sign? It means that it's, it's text that is not visible. You generally don't want to clip it, guys, unless you have to. Uh, but just letting you know that you have basically three major forms of text for now. We'll talk about typography, obviously, more across 182 and 183. But just to tell you how you can input text, this is the point type in which you simply select that point type and click, and then you type whatever you want, Enrica Rocks or something else, obviously. Another way is you start by having an area, and then you go with the area type and click on it, and we'll put text in there. Or you start by having a path, whatever path. It could also be a pen tool path right here. Look how cool this is. Right there. I'm going to switch it so I can see just the path. And then I can go with my text tool and it will obviously put text in there. So these other ones are actually the same thing, but they're vertical. And I'm going to teach this one another time. It's called touch type tool because it's a little bit more advanced. Not, you know, a whole lot, but it's a little bit different. I want to kind of go more basic for now, for today. 
So this is the uh, formatting text. How do I format text? How do I input text in Illustrator? I'm going to close it and I'm going to go into the next part of the text. Sorry, that's actually brushes. So I'm going to go in exercise seven now. And if I zoom on to exercise seven, you'll see that you have a series of a text. Again, is a box, double click on it and say update. What it really means is, is old text that I placed here in this file a while ago and I purposely I had a different font on a different machine and exported it here because I knew this machine did not have that font. Uh, this one is ATC Sans. Same problem of before, how do I fix it? I go with my text tool, click on inside this box, and then I do Command A to select the entire text, and then I go and find a font that I have. Let me find something kind of nice. Let's go with Avenir, this one, perfect. And I'm going to try to make it 11 points. Now notice in the minute I made it bigger, I end up with this little plus sign down here. What it means is my text is clipped. I don't see it all. Again, what are your options? One is to make the box bigger. That's probably the easiest way. The other one is to link with a different text box. Again, it's something I want to show you in a different occasion because it's not advanced, but again, it's another level with the text. So I feel like it's worth waiting. So what happens here? This is a logo right here. So what if I want to wrap my text around the logo? Let me actually clear this. What if I want the logo to be on the side here and maybe have a round element around it, around that logo? Let me actually go in the layers. I'm going to take that logo and I'm going to move it up. And I'm going to take a circular area or even an ellipse and create an ellipse around that logo right there. So what if I want to wrap my text around this ellipse and the logo inside of it? So what I need to do is I need to select the ellipse. I need to shift click the text. And then I want to go under object, text wrap, make. And it will tell you text will wrap around the objects in the current selection, including the type objects. Sure, that's great. Hmm, why is it not working? It should be working. Sorry, guys. It should have worked, but somehow it did not. That is a bummer. So let me find out why. I'm looking for the text wrap palette. Hmm. Okay, let's try to undo it and find out what's the issue here. So what if I grab this and move it down so they're on the same level, on the same layer, sorry, shift click and uh, go and do the same thing. I'm just wondering if it wants it on, to be on the same layer. Also, let's go and look at text wrap options because I don't know what I used the last time. That could be also something that gets in the way. So what is the offset? It means what's the distance between this uh, ellipse I made, what's the white distance between that ellipse and the text that wraps around it? And actually six points is pretty good. It's, it's even maybe more than I want. Uh, maybe three points is enough, but just leave it for now. I'm going to say OK. So those are just the um, uh, options. Now if I say make, and I say OK, now it works. So the trick here that I had forgotten is to put the, the, the objects on the same layer. The fact that I had um, accidentally made the ellipse on the layer of the logo got things kind of complicated. Now, what if you don't want that stroke? Remember, you can select still the ellipse, go in here and say, I don't want it. And there we are. So that's as easy as 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 can be as long as you remember in a way I'm happy that this mistake happened because it reminded me that they have to be on the same layer um, so that's pretty cool so this is kind of what I wanted to show you for now about type we have a few more beautiful lessons on type so don't get too worried because it's gonna be more but for now I just wanted to keep it basic so that you can make your own text remember though just one last thing and I told you earlier you want to select your text and if you by the way if you click twice it will select the entire paragraph so you're clicking on the same exact word like let me do it here again but it will select from the you know beginning lorem 
to kind of the, the area that is kind of what it considers a paragraph there. But if I click here, pretty clear what is selecting. But remember to select your text, even if you do command A and select it all. And don't you see this this in parentheses 13.2? That means you did not at all worry about setting the um, letting the distance between the lines. And that's not a good thing. You really, as a designer, you want to control this stuff. So what I would do is, Enrica told me I need to go three points over the, the, the type size. The type size is 11, so I want to go to 14. There it is. And I recommend always to have a little bit of tracking because, again, it just makes everything more readable. So here we are. So don't ignore doing this because it's really important that again as a designer you have a good grip on your type you don't just let leave it to defaults and stuff and by the way this type is a placeholder so it's not as important but it's still i kind of do it even on stuff like this just to remind myself don't forget to do that because if you don't do it you will forget the next time so this is uh what i wanted to teach you about text the other thing I wanted to teach you was about brushes, because you remember last time we talked about brushes and the way we talked about it was actually in a way that you couldn't really control them very much. You, you used what uh, Illustrator what pr was providing. So I showed you, oops, sorry, I somehow clicked on Zoom. I showed you that you can go under Window, Brush Libraries, Brushes, right, right here. and. Uh, um, these are the, the pre-made one. These are the equivalent of the swatches. You remember that the swatches illustrator gives you some example swatches. Here I give you some example brushes. But you can, do you remember last time I showed you how in the swatches, if you make a cool color, like a gradient, but not even just a gradient, you kind of find this gorgeous red and you say, gosh, I know I'm gonna use this color a whole lot because I'm a person that loves red. I recommend you save it into the swatches by clicking and dragging. So with the brushes is the same thing. You have this kind of brushes pre-made stuff for you, but you can make your own brush right here and you can drag it into your bra brush palette and it will ask you, you know, I always choose the art bra brush is, is kind of the easiest to go, but you know, I will talk about what the difference are later on the different br brushes are but it basically tells you how do you want this this brush to be do you want it to stretch to fit the stroke length yes i generally choose that um and you kind of look at the various uh, options how do you want to color it i generally say none so it kind of follows the colors that you specify here if you choose tint means tint means when you have uh, that color mixed with white so if you use that red and here you chose tint, it would uh, pretty much make it kind of like a pink color. And then you can decide if you want to flip it along, you know, a certain axis, uh, if you want it to overlap, you can just set, simply kind of like play with these settings. I generally leave it pretty much the default. Also, I love the direction to be in this, this direction. You might like it. The other one is up to you. So I'm going to say, okay, now in this case of this brush, the direction doesn't matter as much because it starts and ends in the same exact way. But bottom line is once you set the brush in here, even if you lose this one, can you please mute yourself? I hear a bunch of noise. It's a little bit distracting. But let's say I make this line and I have the stroke right there. And then I go and select this and you can see that it will change it to that particular brush. So um, one other thing I wanted to tell you was, how do you make a brush though? Let's do it. Do you guys remember, in fact, let's bring that line back, even this, that's fine. Uh, I'm gonna actually switch the stroke and the fill. Oh no, I don't like that already has a, a assigned. Sorry, I'm gonna deselect this or when I create my line, it will have assigned that brush that I don't want. I want to make my own brush, right? And generally you start from kind of a stroke and then you say, okay, I like the stroke, but what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use the width tool, command, uh, sorry, shift W, you guys remember this one. I'm gonna use the width tool to make it a little bit thicker here and a little bit, you know, maybe thicker toward the end here too. So it has a weird kind of interesting shape. And I want my brush to be like that. So it's the same story, you select this and you drag it onto your brushes 
and it will ask you the same thing. Do you want to use it as an, as an art brush? Let's actually go with scattered brush and see the different settings because every brush has different settings. You remember we played earlier with the other one. I'm more familiar with the art brushes because that's what I generally use the most. Uh, but let's leave it for now. And remember here it says key color means this is what originally the brush is going to be. You can go in there. And now when I go in and is, where is it? Where did it place it? Oh, it's right here. Sorry. The scatter brushes are kind of like in the more like smaller icon format. So now even if I lose this and I go and create a path with my pen tool, I create the path for the dog, walk the dog. This is obviously a exercise in which the goal was to, actually, I'm going to leave it like this for now. I did not, unfortunately, use the option key or anything to control it, but it doesn't matter for this case. Gosh, for some mysterious reason, the scatter brush does not follow the, the path you made. That's why I tend to use the art brush a lot more. Um, so you kind of, you see the difference between the two. It seems like the scatter brush retained the shape of the original brush versus the art brush. It allows you to kind of follow uh, the, like this one that we had. If I go and create a, a pen tool path and I give it the art brush that I did earlier, right here, it will follow my path versus if I give it the scatter brush, it's still considered the original brush a shape I created. Remember, obviously, that you have pre-made weird, like if you want to do grass, there is grass in there, hands, leaves. What else? What if I go on the options? Do I have anything else I can find? If you go in open brush library, you have what we showed you last, you know, I showed you last time, right? Do you remember the calligraphic and the arrows? They're all here. You have borders. You can choose dash, decorative, frames, geometric. Um, so here you have a lot of options, as you can see. Um, so let's actually look at the geometric for the sake of it. There it is. So now if I take that, that line I just made and choose this, it will spread that geometric brush across. Now remember, if you were to make any brush that looked like this, you could drag it just like we did on here onto this geometric palette and use it later on. So just be aware that you can make your own and it's a matter of drag and drop, just like you, we did for the swatches, to uh, make it into something that is uh, permanently there for you. In fact, Another thing that I love is symbols. Symbols, right now there is none, but what you can do is you can create a drawing, even like a little doodle like this. I'm gonna do a doodle. And I'm gonna say, hey, I want it to be a symbol. You can click on the plus sign, or as usual, you can click and drag onto this symbol palette. What are symbols? Symbols are repeatable content. So imagine that this doodle instead is a beautiful daisy that I know I'm going to use over and over again. I would want to drag it into the symbol. Now movie clip means if it's an animated symbol. In this case, it's just static. So I'm going to choose graphic and I'm going to choose, um, I'm going to leave actually for now everything as it is, as the default. And I'm going to say, okay, because this is a simple um, circle or actually ellipse. Now, even if I lost this content, it's still here in the symbol. And if I wanted to make, as I said, is a daisy and I want to make a field of daisy and I want to have like a hundred, I can just click in the symbol palette and drag it out. And the beauty of it is that all of these are basically what you call instances of this symbol. So they don't take as much space in the file size. So if you had something very elaborate, like a daisy with 15 petals, for example, and its center and all kind of stuff that would take in general, those paths were complex enough that would take a lot. Even this, this um, drawing that you could uh, trace, imagine you make that into a symbol with the two dogs and then you want to use it a bunch of times. Every time you drag it down from the symbol, you see it, but it's not a, a, a brand new drawing is a copy of what's in the symbol and so it doesn't occupy as much in term of file size because it's just an alias of what's in your symbol palette. So remember that brushes, swatches, symbols, they're all things that you can edit in Illustrator and populate your palettes with the material you need for your beautiful illustration and then just you know use it uh, using the palettes.
uh, to be honest, if I remember correctly, I cleaned it up in this file, but I think you do have, let me open a new Illustrator file, because you generally do have, just like in the swatches and in the brushes, you do have some default symbol. There it is. Uh, these are the default symbols that Illustrator provides. That's why I was talking about the daisy, because I remember that was one of those. So this is just you know a symbol that you drag out as many times as you want. You can obviously scale it bigger or smaller and stuff. So it's pretty interesting. Remember, by the way, guys, if you double click on a symbol, you can kind of go inside. There it is. You're about to edit the symbol definition. So you can go and say, OK. Notice up here, what it's telling you is that you're inside this symbol called Gerbera. Uh, there's a type of flower. So if you go in here right now and you modify, for example, a part, you know, let's go with the white arrow and select even just the petal and make it blue. Let's see what happens. Guess what happens? And then I'm going to get out again. Now all the instances are blue. The symbol is blue. It means just that petal, obviously. But you know what I mean? In the minute you double click on an object, you enter the object edit mode, and you can change it, but then you change it everywhere. Because I said, these are basically copies of what's in, in the symbol palette. Same thing here, if I double click on this object, oh sorry, I need to double click with the black arrow, I apologize, I did not remember I was in the white arrow. So if I go in here, and go in here, and, and choose this to be instead of black, like a beautiful deep purple color, I, I, you don't see much of a change, huh? It's very close to black, so let me put something kind of more like pinky color, there we are. So now when I go out, there we are. And if I go in the symbol palettes that I managed to lose, did I? Let's see, right here. Right now, this is pink. So just letting you know that these tools exist for you, you know, from the brushes in which you can drag things into the swatches, in which you can drag color in, to the symbol in which you can drag entire objects in. Is there a way to edit only one of the objects or the symbols? Uh, no, if it's, no, it means if it's in the symbol palette and you go in, uh, you can actually, uh, I think there is a way, not that I've done it very often, to explode your symbol. Let's go in there and, and play with it. What if I go in here? Everything, by the way, that you want to do uh, on a certain palette is right here in the options most of the time. So here, edit symbol is doing what I did earlier by double clicking on it when it's on the canvas. Let's go in symbol options. Mm, it doesn't really let me choose much except graphic movie clip. Mm. So another thing I want to show you, sorry, a little distraction here, is if you go in open symbol library, you have here many, many symbols. For example, if I want to go and do hair and fur, here I have kind of different profiles for hair and fur. I know it's unlikely you're going to use it, but maybe in your uh, self uh, project, you know, in the, in the self portrait, you might have um, something that you might want to have. Oh, let, let me look at sushi. Don't you love sushi? Sorry, guys. Oh, look at that. That's so cool. My goodness, Illustrator rock, doesn't it, guys? Are you excited to learn this stuff? It's amazing. So good question. How do I, if I want to explode this so that I can edit it without changing all the, basically changing the symbol? So let me think that it's something else called appearance of the sometimes, oh, expand. Let's try to expand it. Expand everything, object and fill. Say, OK. All right, so I went in object expand. After I placed the symbol in there, I, that is, by the way, which symbol was it? Was this one, right? Nope. Which one was it? I lost it. Oh, right here is this one. So this one is still tied to the symbol palette. This one shouldn't be. So let me go in here right now and edit a color and see if it changes thing in the symbol palette. Okay, guys? There we are. Ah, uh, life is good, isn't it? So by going and expanding it, object expand, now this, this guy is its own creature, and this guy is actually tied to the sushi symbol palette. So that's how you do it. I don't know who asked that 
beautiful question, but how do I grab a symbol and kind of separate it from the symbol palette so I can edit it and it won't change uh, whatever is in the symbol palette and all the instances here. You go and select the object and go under object expand. And sometimes you'll do expand appearance, but that's all, that's a different story that I'll show you another time. But that's kind of really cool. I really love symbols that you get a lot out of that symbol palette if you need it. Any other questions? Um, can, can you please repeat how you got to the hair and fur and sushi options there? Yeah, you go in the symbol palette. I'm opening the swatches right now. And, I'm, and right here, there's symbol that is, by the way, this is the icon for it. If you go under the options right here, you'll see that one of the option is gonna be open symbol library. And that's where I went to sushi, retro, regal, vector park. And like for example, I love, let's look at nature right now. Ooh, I love all these bugs. See, you did not have to do the project one. You could have, have, have it already done right there, right? <laughs> um, that's beautiful. I, so honestly, guys, I don't, I'm one of those people that makes everything, makes everything from scratch. So I don't use the sim, these type of libraries, but why not? You can. Remember, guys, not just the symbols have these perks of being able to go in the option and choose the symbol library, and you have all this at your fingertip. Also, the brushes has the same thing, right? You go in the options in the brushes and you say open brush library and you have all these options, each one with underneath some more options. Same for the swatches. You can go in the swatches on these on this little option. So remember this little option for each of the palettes is where you have control options, commands that are kind of you know at your fingertip. So you can go under op, open swatch library and here you have all kind of beautiful colors. You do have gradients. Let's use foliage gradients, see what we get. Ooh, look how cool that is. This is a pretty cool you know, palette of foliage gradients, right? So if I have any shape here, that means I can go and click on this and I get that foliage look. So remember the swatches also have all kind of pre-made um, swatches that you can use. Your best friend is always this little icon with a little, um, looks like a paragraph for every one of the palettes. It will pretty much expand your possibility. And remember, I'm just looking at this to keep it simple, but it always opens up options in here too that you can play with, right? You can say, okay, right now I have this shape with just a fill, but I don't have a stroke. You can select this to give it a stroke, or you can go in here and give it a stroke and say, I want the stroke to be three points and I want it to be black, for example. You know what I mean? And here you can also say, and I want the opacity of this whole object to go down. And I want this gradient to actually be um, radial. I don't want it to be um, uh, linear. Uh, so you can edit the gradient and decide that you want different colors in there. You know what I mean? That is really pretty powerful what you can do with just a few clicks in Illustrator. I get excited about teaching this, and I've been teaching it for 20 years. You probably think I'm a nutcase, but I still get excited. Or, you know, I'm just so passionate about this stuff. All right, hold tight a little longer. I'm almost done. I know I'm dumping a lot of information on you, but I'm gonna, I have five more minutes, and I'm gonna ask all of you to ask questions and do whatever it takes to get all this stuff under your belt, a little practice. So this is exercise nine, live paint. So do you, do you guys remember last class when I was doing the, the, the parrot and other stuff, or even the, the pencil tool exercise? Do you know, let me go and try to open the pencil tool. Let's see here. Do you remember when we did the pencil tool that I said, okay, you can use the pencil tool or the pen tool, whatever you want, but, um, and I never, how is it? I always forget where is the pencil tool. It just shocks me. It tells you how much I use it. It's still weird. Sorry, let's, let's use the pen tool. Let's do that, my favorite tool anyway. I'm gonna click. Down from there. What do you say? I believe the pencil oh, tool is like. Under the, sh is, under the sh is under the shape tool, one second. I, I know exactly. Oh, how do I get out? I'm trying to get out and it's somehow my computer is stuck. Hey, all right, now I got it. Sorry, it seemed to be that I, w I was gonna have, having a glitch. So it's under the shaper tool, shaper tool. That's where it is. Sorry, thanks for helping out. But it all of a sudden came to my mind that is under that tool. So do you remember when I did this and I said, okay, you got to 
create this and then you go in and create this part right here and create all your shapes in fact actually let me do the last one I'm gonna um, I want to create them on separate layers so they don't overlap because when they overlap sometimes the pencil tool joins them and it makes it much harder to color them independently so I want all of these each to have a different color so I'm going to make it all in different um, layers right so one way to color your illustrations guys is to basically have a series of closed paths and you go in and color each individually right and and then once you color them you decide the order the stacking order for example I'm going to go here and say I want this one to be purple I want this one to be blue and I want this one to be green or whatever color you want you, you kind of follow me right and I want this one oh sorry is locked I apologize I don't know why I ended up locking it by mistake uh, and I want this one to be like red or orange right so you might say, wait a minute, but I want this to be on top and this one to be below. How do I do that? One way is to obviously grab layer three and move it on top of layer four. That's one way. And if you want this guy below, you obviously grab this layer and make sure it is on top of layer five. So that's kind of the way I generally do it. Another way to do it, though, it could also be select the object and go under object or range. And you can say, I want it to be sent to the very back. It didn't do it oh no I, I know why I didn't do it because it's all in separate layers because I actually like to organize my stuff by moving layers around but some people prefer to use the arrange doesn't matter either way but you can see that what I did here to color my my illustration is created all separate closed paths in this case with a pen pencil tool you could have used the pen tool and color them so what happens if you have a situation like this in which you have to color this bear and and certain path you know if you say okay I'm gonna take this and I'm gonna make it brown a brown color like this and I want the ears just this part to be a different brown color to be a much lighter brown like this it's tricky right because how do I do this I guess I can put this in the front and this in the back you know, it, it's tricky though. It, it gets really difficult. Like if I want the nose to be black um, and I have all these circle in here. So another way to do it is something called live paint. It's one of my favorite tools. I mean, I have a few favorite as you might have guessed. So the way it works is you select the entire, all the shapes you got. And you, by the way, I want to show you one thing that I hid for you though. There are the whiskers because I don't, I, we don't need the whiskers for now. So you select all the shapes and you hit K. Now, before you do that though, I generally make a copy of this. So what I do is I, I say Command C, I create a new layer and I do a Command V. Doesn't matter if it's shifted or not. Another way to go was to do edit, paste and place. So it's in the same exact spot. And I'm gonna actually make it disappear and lock it. Because the problem is when you do live paint, once you convert it to live paint, it's really, it, 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 it can get tricky to undo it. So I generally save another one in a layer, tuck it away just in case I need to go back. And I recommend you guys do that. So what happens with live paint? Let me show you the swatches though. Pay attention to these swatches, okay? When I hit K, what happens? And pay attention to the bounding box around the bear. I'm going to hit K right now. By the way, this is light paint right here. Do you see that my cursor becomes this three little squares? And right now I'm on the square with this lash. Pay attention on the swatches. This is the same square. Now I'm going to use the arrow key and I start moving. Look, look, look what happens in the swatches. I'm moving around. And you can obviously move down. You can move however you want to move. But you can basically prepare the colors you want uh, for your illustration. And then go through the swatches and say, okay, I want this color. And you dump it. And I want that color to also be here and here and here. But I want the interior of the ears to be a different color. So you go in these areas when they, when they highlight in red, if you click, it will dump the color that you have selected in the swatches in that area. 
So now I might say, hey, look, now I want a darker brown for the inside of the ears. Oh, I screwed up, Bill. I forgot this one. Ouch. Sorry, I'm going to go back. No big deal. See, I'm using the arrow keys to navigate. Um, another thing I want to do is I want a um, darker brown or a different brown for the little snout. The little snout is made out of various pieces, as you can see. So I'm basically going in. And for the bottom one, I want an even darker brown right here and right here. Now for this guy, I want the nose. I want it a black. So I'm going to move up next to the red that is the black. I'm going to click on here, and I'm going to click on here and on here. So in a matter of second, I colored my bear. Now, problem, I have all these strokes. No big deal, right? I select my, notice the bounding box little squares have changed because it's telling you that it is a um, uh, light paint. What you can do here is you can see that it has the stroke. You select it, and you hit none. So now my bear is so cute, isn't it? And if you say, yeah, but I actually want, you know, look at this uh, light paint. You also have a light paint selection tool in there that is Shift L. So when I select that, it allows me to select, you know, parts of it. Right now it's selecting all the white area and, and you can change it. You can say, I want that instead of being white to be something else. Another thing you can do is go back into the K mode and it gets you back into here, into the swatches. Again, I, I, have, I need to open them so you can see that moving my arrow keys loads the same color that is in the swatch. So that's kind of, you know, I think Life Paint is really cool. I'm going to actually choose this one. Also, you can go in and choose it, obviously. Use the arrow keys or just click. No, no big deal. I like the ears to be a little bit darker. And maybe these one, I want them also to be a little bit darker. So I'm going to choose this. Maybe this. Choose this and this to be darker. But you see how easy it is to color your illustrations without having to worry about even having closed path. Now you're telling me, really? Let me show you. This is really cool. So if I go and select and create a bunch of lines. Sorry, guys right here. I'm going to make them black. And I convert to that. Hey, guys, what happened? I don't know why I didn't do it. There it is. It did it now. I don't know why earlier it didn't do it. So if I go in here and I convert to this to live paint, I hit K, and I'm going to dump something in the middle, obviously, because it's the only area that is, you know, closed. Then what happens if I go with my white arrow, select an anchor and move it? It goes away, right? Because it's not closed anymore. So be aware though that you could have lines like that and just fill in certain areas. Now what if my lines are not perfectly closed? What if I have something like this or something like this? Can I still do a live paint? Sorry, I'm moving it a little bit funky. So let me do live paint right here and hit K and try to dump some color in there. It doesn't do it because you can see it has a gap in there. So what else can we do? Let me actually undo the live paint in there. What if I go in object live paint and I choose gap option? So in gap option, you have small gaps. Paint stops a small gap. What if I choose large gap now and I set it as the default? So now I'm making that into live paint again, and I'm going to try to dump something in it. And now it works because I set that large gap to be okay. So my point is, at this point, you don't even need to have everything closed. You could have large gap and it still works. Now, what if the gap is still too large and you have, oops, sorry. Let me actually do something else. I had something else in mind. Here, so let's say you have a series of lines and the gap is a little bit still too big to create. I'm gonna go crazy right here. By the way, if you go to the last point, it will connect it, it will loop it. So you see it has this, this gap in here 
let's say it's still too big, even if you go in the large. So you can obviously go with the anchor, the Y arrow, and move it closer and see if it works. Another thing you can do is with your Y arrow, you select this point and this point, the easiest way to select both anchors by clicking and dragging a marquee. And then you do Command J for join. And it will create the connection there. And all of a sudden, your path is a closed path. So remember this J for join. So Apple or Command uh, J will close the gaps as long as you select those two anchors that are surrounding the gap. I'm going to stop the video. You've been troopers to follow so 